don't be dismayed by the empty seats here because everybody has several committees and we're in a kind of a crucial time in Congress right now when our ratings aren't the highest in the history of, of Congress and they're all working hard and then trying to set in on several committees at one time. But uh, we have a court report over here that takes down everything you say and do and, and uh, goes into the congressional record and people read what you're saying and doing a hundred years from now. And uh, that's what's important. And every other member of Congress gets a copy of your testimony and usually either they read it or somebody on their committee reads it to them. And, uh, but they'll be coming and going from time to time. Mr. Rohrbacher's here, and he's going to introduce, uh, because of personal friendship, one of the, uh, those of you that will be testifying. Uh, in front of you are packets uh, containing the written testimony, the biographies, and the truth and testimony disclosures for today's witnesses. And uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. And, Everybody will have other opening statements will be put in the record. So I say to you, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here today for the second in a series of STEM in Action hearings. Now, the purpose of this hearing will be to showcase a variety of public-private partnerships and initiatives across the nation that are successfully inspiring the future science, technology, engineering, and math uh, or STEM workforce. The federal government is investing several billion a year on STEM education. While there may be federal role, industry, philanthropic organizations, nonprofits, and local governments have also acknowledged the importance of making investments in STEM. Uh, partnerships and initiatives formed by these investments are very critical to the program. Uh, particularly in this uh, difficult budget climate, we want to highlight some of these efforts and partnerships that are thriving with little or no federal investment. Specifically, the witnesses before us are all involved with tremendously successful STEM-related uh, competitions. As we can all agree, a well-educated and trained STEM workforce is imperative and key to our future economic prosperity, but we have to capture and hold the attention of our nation's youth in science and engineering so they want to pursue these careers, not simply be forced into them simply because we need them. Sitting in a classroom and just memorizing text or taking notes can often drain the enthusiasm from even the most promising steward. Uh, our, our students. This, that's why it's important for us to hear from these folks about their creative alternatives to teach and inspire kids who may not even realize they're learning. Today we have witnesses from the corporate foundation and nonprofit worlds showcasing their creative efforts to inspire, motivate, and produce our next generation of scientists and engineers with little or no federal funds. Our nation's always been number one in science and innovation. In order to maintain this prominence, we have to have an, quote, all hands on deck, unquote, uh, attitude toward it. Everyone in same, some way, shape or form, or has, a, has to have a role to play in STEM education so that our children and our grandchildren can also experience a vibrant economy with access to good, solid jobs. I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses, and I thank you for being here with us today. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mrs. Johnson for her opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for all the witnesses that have been invited today. Uh, as I said so many times before, we truly have a STEM education crisis in this country. And I don't need to remind this audience about how poorly too many of our students perform on tests of math and science proficiency or how important it is for the future of our country that we do something to address this serious problem. By we, I mean all of the stakeholders, federal agencies, states, school districts, businesses, nonprofit organizations, and parents. We must all work together to leverage our respective strengths and resources to tackle this issue. STEM education in this country is truly a complex and grand challenge that no one entity can solve alone. Today's witnesses represent the private sector. Country companies ranging in size from multinational enterprises on down to local businesses are realizing more and more how critical it is 
to the long-term success of their businesses, that they have access to a highly skilled and well-prepared workforce. While our government is turning the, the clock back, other countries are pouring resources into building not just their associate and bachelor degree level workforce, but also their PhD level research scientists, engineers, providing them a competitive edge we once took for granted. One thing that's interesting to me is that while some of my colleagues in Congress think the federal government has no role here, an increasing number of major U.S. companies are turning to partnerships with government, including the federal government, to achieve their workforce needs. President Obama also recognized the importance of partnerships when he launched the Educate to Innovate campaign last year. As part of this campaign, the private sector coordinated with the White House to launch Change the Equation. Change the Equation brought together a coalition of more than 100 CEOs from some of the nation's largest companies, all dedicated to working together to improve STEM education in the country. These companies, of course, include Time Warner Cable, Exxon Mobil, and Xerox, to name a few, have all committed resources to STEM programs across the country. Many of these successful programs are run in partnership with federal agencies such as NASA and the National Science Foundation. Among the new public-private partnerships announced as part of the President's Educate to Innovate campaign was the National STEM Video Game Challenge. And I look forward to hearing from Mr. Gallagher about the National STEM Video Game Challenge and how he and his colleagues work with the White House and other partners to make the competition a success. Competitions and challenges have tremendous potential to both inspire students and teach the STEM knowledge and skills in ways that the traditional classroom teaching cannot. However, we also know from a recent National Academies report on informal STEM learning and a hearing we held at them the same topic in the 111th Congress that there remains a big gap in understanding how students learn outside the classroom and to what extent informal experiences influences their long-term interest and success in STEM. Most of what we know or think we know is based on anecdotes or attitudinal surveys. Here there is a clear and unique federal role in developing the necessary body language, body of knowledge. The National Science Foundation is the leading entity in this country for funding research on STEM learning in both formal and informal environments, including comp competitions. The results of NSF funded research over many decades have helped and will continue to help to ensure that education practitioners are incorporating effective practices with measurable results. At the end of the day, what counts is whether the STEM programs we are hearing about are achieving their desired results, not how much money we are spending on them or even how many students they touch. We're all in this together. I commend the witnesses and your colleagues in private sector for your efforts in helping to improve STEM education in this country. But I'd also like to repeat a request that I made at our last STEM hearing, that we not continue to ignore the unique and important role of the federal government in improving STEM education in this country. Mr. Hall, I thank you very much for this hearing, and then I yield back. I thank the ladies. Thank the general lady from Texas. She yields back. And if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, statements can be added to the record at this point or a little bit later. And at this time, I want to begin to introduce our first panel of, of witnesses. Uh, our first witness is Mr. Tony Norman, President and CEO of Innovation First International, which Mr. Norman founded in 1999. I'm proud to say he's a constituent from my district. Uh, one of the interesting things about Tony and Innovation First is the commitment they make to the local community of Greenville, Texas. Uh, if you visit their plant, you'll see local high school students uh, uh, working on projects and interning in a facility to learn more about engineering and technology. Many of these students have gone on to college to study engineering uh, at uh, Tony's uh, suggestion and his behest. and. Uh, uh, he truly gives back to his hometown, wants to build a, a lasting success for 
uh, Greenville and for the nation, and he's an international operator. I find him sometimes in China, sometimes he's somewhere in Europe, but he's kind of hard to find, but we're very fortunate to have him here today because he's one of the busiest men I know. I had the pleasure of speaking at one of his operations in Orlando. I think there were five or 10,000 folks there. And Tony told me I had three minutes to speak and I got into my speech about a minute and a half and he was doing what my wife always does to me when I'm making speeches, he was doing like this. So, and I think he meant for me to stop, and I later learned that with all the great technology in the bosom of the United States of America right there in the crowd, we had a malfunction of some type. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but uh, it was a great meeting with a lot of young kids that were there. Those who won were happy. Those who lost were determined to come back and win next year, but it really gives you a, a new perspective on the country when you see these youngsters that folks like these three people that are here testifying for us today have bragged on, supported, and helped and look forward to. Uh, our second uh, witness is uh, Mrs. Nancy Conrad, and I've known her husband for many years. Uh, and at this time, I yield to Mr. Rohrbacher of California to introduce Mrs. Uh, Conrad. I really wanted to introduce her, but uh, Rohrbacher outranks me, and he's a, a guy that I really need his vote every now and then. I'm even going out to his home Sunday to make a speech for him Sunday at noon and going to fly back Sunday night. That's how much I think of Mr. Rohrbacher. So you ought to be helping me a little more than you are. <laughs> <laughs> Recognize Mr. Rohrbacher to introduce me as Conrad. You got it, Mr. Chairman. You got it. Uh, it's my personal and professional pleasure to introduce Nancy Conrad uh, to members of the committee and to all of you. Uh, she has been a close friend for many years. Uh, I was a close friend, uh, uh, of course, when Pete was alive and, uh, uh, he, and, and I was a young member of this committee. And he was a very inspiring, inspiring human being. And we know all of his exploits in terms of Apollo 12 and the third man on the moon. But uh, when Pete was taken from us, uh, Nancy picked up the challenge of making sure that America and the world keeps moving outward and realized that perhaps the uh, most important uh, thing we have to do to achieve the goal of keeping America the number one space power and keeping humankind in the ascension into, into space was the fact that we have to have our young people trained and motivated to be able to participate in this great task that humankind has, which is to deliver, to deliver our species beyond uh, where we're at and into the heavens and, and into the universe. Uh, so. With this, uh, after Pete's passing, Nancy uh, started the Spirit of Innovation Awards as part of the Pete Conrad Foundation. Uh, she herself, of course, was an English teacher and very involved in education and has been well known throughout the world as an advocate for uh, uh, science education and science uh, as part of a young person's uh, curriculum. But uh, uh, today she's going to be, I believe, talking to us about the Spirit of Innovation Award. And I believe she deserves an award for innovation uh, in the, her approach. And I uh, think that it's a, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. And I know that uh, it, uh, it should inspire members of this committee, but also we should be grateful. And the students who are participating in this should be grateful for something that excites young people about uh, science, engineering, mathematics, things that will carry humankind to our next step. So uh, we welcome Nancy Conrad. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. Nancy, we do admire and respect you and, and remember the service of you and your husband. And rec uh, reclaiming my time, uh, thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher, for the good introduction. Our third witness and final witness is Mr. Michael D. Gallagher, uh, President and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association. Mr. Gallagher also leads the ESA's uh, partnership with the Congressional Caucus for Competitiveness and Entertainment Technology. Previously, he was the Assistant Secretary for Communications and Information at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, and I had the pleasure of visiting with him some time ago. And we thank all of you because we know it's trouble, uh, expensive, 
you have to have time to get ready for this testimony. You had to come here from somewhere, and you have to eat while you're here and, and stay somewhere while you're here. You give a lot to be here, and we appreciate you. We really ought to have these seats full, but as I explained to you, we're in kind of a desperate time up here. We're trying to survive uh, uh, a lot of bad situations that's happening to our country and uh, we thank you for giving this time what I'm trying to say and not saying it too well but as our witnesses should know and probably do know spoken testimony is limited to five minutes we're not going to hit the gavel on you if you go over five minutes but it's close to five minutes as you can stay the more likely you are to win the drawing that we may have when this is over <laughs> but uh, the members of the commercial committee will have five minutes to ask questions. We'll try to hold them to that same. So I recognize our first witness, Mr. Norman, now for five minutes, but you won't be held to that. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you, committee members, for inviting me here. Um, I have 20 years of experience in educational robotics, and it basically started back when I worked as an electrical engineer at one of the largest defense contractors for this country. We spent a lot of time inspiring kids and youth to take careers in STEM education. And in fact, one of the accomplishments we actually had was get to bring those kids here to the White House uh, after winning a championship. Because of that experience that we kept seeing how these kids kept growing in their, in their inspiration, uh, myself and one of the other team members decided, you know what, let's believe our own, own, own medicine here and let's start our own company. So we started our own company, as Congressman Hall said, in Greenville, Texas. And it's, it's a really a great high growth story. In the last three years, we've created 150 jobs. We now have offices worldwide. And just to kind of give you a quick review of a few of them, one of our divisions, Rack Solutions, builds racking equipment for data centers and actually a few products for the U.S. military. And the exciting part is, in this very highly competitive market we're in, we are actually able to compete with U.S. manufacturing. So we felt that was a great accomplishment. Uh, we actually do know kids. In fact, we know kids so well that one of our most successful companies is creating toys. This toy division was actually inspiration as well from the robotics program we've been uh, participating with, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. And our largest accomplishment to date was last year we were just uh, uh, received the specialty toy of the year in the toy industry. So that uh, was pretty exciting for us. The VEX Robotics Design System is basically from our third division. It was created as an educational robotics kit, and it's really designed for an open-ended problem solving. It's not just a set of instructions you actually go through. But really, it's more than just a kit. It's, it's the only platform with significant penetration in the daytime classroom and extracurricular competitions. So that's extremely important, and I hope to emphasize that a little bit later. We are showing up everywhere in the classroom, and I was just curious if you guys could find the VEX robot in this picture. Project Lead the Way is one of our partners. We're partnered with many uh, 501c3s. Uh, Project Lead the Way is the largest daytime curricular program in the U.S. and they endorse the platform and also endorse our, out, our robotics competition as well as their competition. Technology Student Association, another partner of ours in the, um, in the space, they are actually a co-curricular program where they are in the classroom and have competitions out of the classroom. They run about 200 competitions but for robotics they actually came to us and joined the VEX robotics competition. Uh, another 501c3 best, Boosting Engineering Science and Technology, is another inspiring. This one is free to all the schools that participate, and all of their electronics and sensors are basically from the VEX robotic system because we have the leading platform in the educational space. So we come to the actual VEX Robotics competition itself before basically seeing the partners we have with the, with the uh, equipment we provided. Uh, this last year where Congressman Hall was there, uh, we were at Disney World. These are some of our corporate sponsors that we're pretty proud of. VEX is the largest middle school and high school robotics competition in the world. <clears throat> this is kind of a comparison of where we compare to some of our other programs that are out there as well. Excuse me. This is basically I want to kind of take you through and show you a few images from the competition. It's really hard to describe the excitement and the feeling you get there and the enthusiasms that the kids actually feel and the scale of it. Basically, it takes a lot of donations from corporate sponsors to actually make an event of this size actually happen. But it affects the students in such a way that 
it's, we're getting to kids that never would be interested in science and technology, and it's basically helping build that workforce for the future. You can see the scale of this event. Once again, this was our, our world, our, our main arena for the finals, and the pit area in the previous slide shows you just the enormous. It's like a huge trade show. Over 600 teams were at this event. And of course, the excitement. Getting them ready, getting them exciting about science and technology, and putting these corporations on display. So as a corporation donates, it's not just a blind donation. They're putting their company on display. So when it comes to recruiting these kids and building that workforce for the future, they're actually there ready, and the students know who they are, and in fact, they want to actually go to that company. Uh, recently, we've done quite a bit with the Boy Scouts of America. We helped them create their first uh, robotics merit badge. Uh, we had a, a big showing at their jamboree, and it was extremely exciting. Same thing up here at the mall in D.C. And I'm just going to end here with we really plan to continue to forge a relationship with more nonprofits, with industry, with leaders in the corporate world, and really help try to build and inspire that workforce for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now recognize Mr. Gallagher for five minutes for his testimony. I mean, Mrs. Conrad for her testimony. <laughs> Same five minutes. In five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss our participation in solving America's STEM education crisis, or as I call it, the edudemic. In a recent article in the New York Times, Tom Friedman said, if we want more jobs, we need to create more Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs took his knowledge of STEM and created a phenomenon that impacts our lives in ways we can't even currently quantify. Bill Gates, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, Mark Zuckerberg, they've done the same thing. They too have taken their knowledge of STEM, combined it with innovation and entrepreneurship, and created world-changing breakthroughs which have forever altered the way knowledge is valued, shared, and utilized. The hallmark of America's culture is innovation and entrepreneurship. It's how we got to the moon. It's how companies like Apple, Facebook, and Google were formed. It's how our country will continue to explore the universe, discover cures for disease, and become good stewards of the world we share with our global neighbors. If we're to reinforce America's economic stability and ignite our nation's passion for STEM education, we need to embrace an academic plan that focuses on the relevance of the knowledge we share with our students. We all know memorizing facts to pass a test isn't doing the job. The Spirit of Innovation Awards program, the flagship of the Conrad Foundation, is rooted in this concept. Our program challenges teams of high school students to create solutions to real-world problems using STEM-based principles and practices supported by innovative thinking and entrepreneurial skills. We are energizing the next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators needed to sustain our economy. Students who participate in the program come from all socioeconomic levels. Our student entries come from across the United States, from the Navajo Nation to Thomas Jefferson High School, ranked the number one high school in the country. We're pleased that one third of our students are girls and one third are inner city students. The Spirit of Innovation Awards program operates year round through our online community and our annual event. Our teams are supported in their journey by their teachers and our community of mentors and experts who together endeavor to help these students hone their own design skills as they create the innovative products. From aerospace and energy to cybersecurity and nutrition, no question is too large for these students. Finalist teams are selected to participate in our Innovation Summit at NASA Ames Research Center, where they meet world-renowned scientists and entrepreneurs from industry, government, academia, and venture capital. The students present their ideas and are coached and mentored by these experts with the intent of bringing the students' product to the marketplace. Winners are awarded a grant to continue the development of their product, and selected teams are invited into our portal where we assist them in patenting their product if it's needed and then licensing their intellectual property. This is a way for them to monetize their ideas without dropping out of school to create companies. 
We are four years young and already seeing amazing results. Let me provide you with a few examples. Winning teams of the past have addressed nutrition needs for astronauts, developed light electric cars, and a smartphone biomedical application for monitoring heart rates. Daniel and Isaac from Katy, Texas have two patents on an offshore geothermal energy generating system and they have been archived into the Kennedy Presidential Library. Michaela and Shannon from Battle Creek, Michigan created a nutrition bar that meets NASA's standards for nutrition and stability in microgravity. They've been honored at the White House and recently their product was flown aboard STS-134. This is where real science gets real. Our program and the media coverage our students receive shines a spotlight on how cool science can be and how interesting and challenging the careers in STEM can be. We are not just growing a program, we are driving a movement. We've turned geeks into rock stars. Our competition is open to all who wish to participate free of charge. We are supported in partnership with Lockheed Martin, PepsiCo, and Kraft Foods. We receive program support from NASA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the American Society for Nutrition, the William James Foundation, the National Institute of Health, Sigma Xi, Museums and Science Centers, Popular Science Magazine, Space Ref, and STEM Connector. This year, we are also taking advantage of a unique opportunity to provide our winning teams of students with a global scientific experience. In partnership with the Department of State, we are planning for winning teams to travel to a major international conference on sustainable development to be held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 2012. Interactions with scientists from around the world will have a lasting impression on these students whose paths may be toward global science and technology. We are solely funded through philanthropic grants and individual and corporate entities. Our biggest challenge is funding the program so we can scale it to reach mass numbers of students and expand the services and programs associated with the contest. The Spirit of Innovation Awards program is the only incentivized learning program to combine STEM with innovation and entrepreneurship. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members, I believe we must all accept the challenge to embrace and propel our students to tomorrow's innovation generation. While our education system may be broken, our students are not. When given the opportunities, their talents shine. They're amazing, they're innovative, and they're brilliant. Our students will be the next Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page, and Sergey Brin. This is how we engage America in STEM education, and this is how we build the innovative workforce for the future. We need to leave a better country for our children, but we also need to leave better children for our country. Thank you for your kind attention, and I will be delighted to answer your question. And we thank you. I do now recognize Mr. Gallagher for five minutes. Chairman Hall, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, distinguished members of the committee, I am grateful for the opportunity to testify at this hearing this morning. Uh, my name is Michael Gallagher and I am the President and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association, the trade association that represents the industry that creates video games on virtually every device that has a screen and a battery, including uh, video game consoles, personal computers, handheld devices like cell phones, and over the internet. We um, at ESA, uh, the staff and the members, are very appreciative of the continued focus of this committee on the limitless value of technology and education and the importance that that focus has to the American workforce in the years ahead as well as today and we're grateful to be part of this conversation. Webster's Dictionary defines invent to invent is to produce for the first time through the use of the imagination or of ingenious thinking and experiment. Inventions are the bedrock of the United States economy since it was born. If you look at our history, in addition to the current technologies that Mr. Conrad highlighted, but going back to the light bulb, planes, trains, and automobiles, the cell phone, telephones in general, a computer, and the internet, each of these breakthroughs, each of these inventions, created and spawned scores of millions of jobs for generations of Americans. 
What they all share in common are root elements in STEM, in STEM and in STEM education. It's a vital economic interest for our country that we continue to be as dynamic and world leading as possible in the area of educating our youth in STEM. Yet today, there's a, a yawning gap between our needs as a society and as a country and what we're producing in the classroom. And that gap is recognized in a bicameral, bipartisan, uh, state and federal arenas, business and the, and the uh, public sector all agree that we're in a mode where we must enhance our uh, productivity in the classroom for the benefit of our, of our, our current and our future uh, economic uh, aspirations. The video game industry is living in this challenge. Today, we are a $25 billion domestic industry. We've grown 120% over the last five years. And our, the jobs that are created are across the country in 30 different states where we have um, uh, sites and, and, and enormous productivity coming from uh, jobs in our industry. These jobs are fundamentally dependent on physics, math, computer science, and the core STEM curricula that this hearing is focused upon. However, beyond our industry, we also have the need of broader corporate America looking at trying to innovate and, and invent in today's economy. And in a study that was concluded a year ago, uh, w over 100 of the Fortune 500 companies indicated that they would be using video game technology to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of their workforce. And these are companies like Bank of America, IBM, Canon, uh, American Express, and others who are seeing the value of the technology that, that is um, inherent in what we do. Looking beyond, however, just the corporate opportunity, uh, ESA was approached by the Joan Gans Cooney Center, otherwise known as Sesame Street, uh, about three years ago and was challenged to do more in the area of education because they, as educators, understood the connection between our industry and youth. And many studies show, Pew has a study that shows, uh, not surprisingly, that 97% of boys play video games. But 94% of girls do as well. And so we have a medium that is creative, that is dynamic, that is captivating to the youth of our country. We should be capturing that energy. So in partnership with Microsoft, PlayStation, Electronic Arts within our industry, as well as the Joan Gans Cooney Center, the MacArthur Foundation, Eline Ventures, and AMD, we launched two different competitions focused on uh, capturing that interest of youth and putting it into the classroom in a practical, exciting way for uh, education purposes. I look forward in the question and answer session to detailing the specifics of those competitions and their success. But this last March, we awarded, um, we, we had one of the, the um, national challenge uh, awarded its prizes for the first round in the first year of competition. There were over 500 entrants in the competition and we brought a short video for the committee today to give you a flavor of what's happening in the classroom with the ideas that come from our industry. And if we could roll the clip, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And I thank you, uh, beg your pardon. <laughs> simulation games. RPG, adventure, and action. I got into game making when I was 10, and I decided, why was I playing the games? Why don't I make my own game? The first program I wrote <laughs> was to teach me my multiplication duties. I used comments from my teacher and friends to make my game more fun. After that, I took the game and gave it to my cousins. This is my user testing. It teaches a lesson about teamwork. When I grow up, I want to be a computer programmer. I might be a doctor when I grow up. You'll be seeing me making games in the future. That's great. 
Uh, now, thank you for all of your testimony and uh, remind members of the committee that uh, we're still limited to five minutes on our re uh, questions and I'll yield myself five minutes to start with. And I just I want to start out by saying how amazed I am, uh, Mr. Norman, at the progress you've made uh, from the day you broke ground out there and how amazed I was when I just accidentally stopped by to visit you and to meet you there and to get to walk through your place to see youngsters at tables and uh, uh, success just obvious and you trying to buy all the property around you to where you could expand. Uh, I thought back to Eric Johnson, who was a great man that, that bought Texas Instruments. And you know, I was talking to him one time and he said he bought Texas Instruments on December the 6th, 1941. On December 7th, 1941, he was driving out to see what he had bought. And I said, Mayor, as a matter of an engineer, you're great, but as a matter of timing, you're super because December 7th, 1941 is a date that live in infamy that started World War II and TI just went straight up like your company's done. Uh, and I had the privilege of witnessing the VEX Robotics World Championship earlier this year and we walked through and got to be, meet with a lot of those youngsters. Talking to these brilliant and engaging young people and watching their enthusiasm as they competed and talked to us, both of us, about their robots. And, and that was really inspiring to me. And if I recall correctly, there's no prize, no monetary or otherwise prize for the winners of the VEX uh, Robotics World Championship other than the thrill of victory. And those that lost seemed to be just as thrilled to have participated. And the one thing they were really moved in on was next year. They were getting ready for the next one. Uh, what's providing the motivation for these kids to compete year after year? What, what do you find? Well, I, th I think the main thing that's driving it, I mean, obviously it's kind of like the Flintstones vitamins. It's fun, but they don't really know it's good for them. And then once you start getting them involved, uh, I had a case with my own son. He didn't know what I did until he started seeing the robotics and the programs and stuff we did around that, that program. So some of these parents that are engineers have, for the first time, taught their kids what they have done and, and what they do for a living. And they see us as professionals in the workforce creating these things, and especially for our toy division, for the high school students working for us and the college interns, to see something they worked on all of a sudden appear in the real world is, is pretty amazing. So that robotics competition does that same thing with all those corporate sponsors that are involved. They get a kind of a peek into what that company does and, and what it would be like to, to work in that kind of environment with science and technology as their background. And Vic's uh, Robotics World Championships an international event share a little more with us, if you will, about how these teams and alliances from different parts of the world work together in the competition and how this provides and enhances very valuable communication and cooperation skill among the contestants. Yeah, you know, one, one of the aspects of the competition is basically putting, forcing two teams to work together as an alliance against another two teams and it changes each match so you're not sure who who you're going to be competing with the next time so it forces kind of that uh, be nice and don't do anything you shouldn't and uh, it, it kind of teaches them that that professional respect you should have uh, as you work in the real environment. So once again it's life lessons as well as science and technology. I'll send my grandchildren over there for you to talk to. <laughs> uh, what makes VEX Robotics different from other programs that are available today and, and what what does it take to accelerate growth and reach more students with this program? And what barriers do you face in achieving accelerated growth? Well, what, I mean, what holds you back? What What are you concerned with? Well, we're, we've been involved, like I said, for 20 years, and I've been involved in a lot of the programs out there, and a lot of them are extremely good at what they do. Uh, what kind of differentiates VEX is we, we started uh, and dissected everything, as engineers do. Uh, we started with the platform, made sure we had the most high-tech tech platform we have and also make it scalable so it's cost effective. We looked at the program and how important the program was in mentorship from these uh, other companies. And then the partners that we went, you saw some of the 501c3s were involved with in getting those partners there. 
Then comes the daytime curriculum. You need to be in the daytime as well as extracurricular, and we actually accomplish both of those uh, through our program. And really, our growth has been all grassroots, finding these companies to spend money instead of recruiting people to put, put their name out there in front of these students and help their environment. And then we, you know, obviously any money we would get would help accelerate that path, but right now we're doing an extremely good job uh, doing it the grassroots way. I have about nine seconds left. Uh, uh, to Mrs. Conrad and uh, Mr. Gallagher, I'd want to ask you, what do you find to be the most rewarding and inspiring aspects of the work you're doing? But I may get a chance to do that later. If I don't, I'm going to ask uh, unanimous consent to write letters to you and ask you to answer these questions. Uh, at this time, I recognize uh, Mrs. Johnson, the ranking member of this committee, a very good friend of mine and a neighbor of mine in Texas. I recognize you for five minutes, uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hall. I am very impressed with the witnesses today, and I'm delighted that you've taken time to come. Uh, I have been working with some nonprofit groups that are attempting to improve and be a part of volunteers in STEM programs um, around the country there in 200 and some chapters. And one of the things that we have um, encountered is the lack of evaluation tools. So what I'd like to do is ask you to share some of the tools you use to evaluate your program and the effectiveness with students and then allow me to copy from you. <laughs> <laughs> So would you start, Mr. Snow? Sure. sure. Um, well, I mean, obviously there's the, the normal studies. We just recently did a study through Georgia Tech to ha kind of put quantitative numbers on what's happening. But for us, it's really easy to see what we saw even in our local high school is all of these students that started not only started heading towards that science and technology role, but they also became the leaders in most of the organizations within the school, anything from a social thing to a chess club to a math club, and it really gave them that rise to be a leader as well. So that, uh, that's one way, and also, once again, they come back in jobs. We see a lot of them come back as co-ops, and we literally build our entire workforce from the robotics community. That, that's how we, we've been, we have eight, uh, team leaders from around the country that are leaders in our company now. Am I on? Now I'm on. Thank you. I need adult supervision all the time. Um, <laughs> we need an engineer. Is there an engineer? So, we have a system that measures what we do. We work with a former NASA educator to help us with that. But in addition, we have a um, system that was designed by a student that measures the student's response to the work that we're doing. Uh, the student actually entered the ISAF, the Intel competition, with this matrix and used us as the guinea pig. And it was just such a fantastic system to measure a student's input into the program, so we've now adopted his tool as part of our measuring system. Um, and I think if you're going to do student-centered education, what better place than to have a student-centered measurement tool in place? Yes, uh, from our perspective, the first thing is great partners. Um, if I, I listed a number of them, but the Joan Gans Cooney Center has been an innovator in education for over 40 years. The MacArthur Foundation is extraordinarily dedicated to doing things that have an impact in the classroom. And from um, our perspective, our industry is very young and it's very action oriented. We don't spend a lot of time talking about what we're doing. We spend a lot of time and energy doing it. So I would say the focus first on expert partners and leveraging their knowledge of how to judge success in the classroom from an innovation perspective, not from an inertia perspective. Which if the members of the committee or, or the Mr. Chairman, if you saw the movie Waiting for Superman, you can see the tremendous amount of inertia that's present in our education system. Uh, the partners that we work with have a reputation for being innovative and overcoming it. Um, second, the focus is on the kids. It's on the learner, not on the teacher. 
and when the learners are engaged, uh, you're going to get a better outcome, and we see that intuitively, but um, the, both the MacArthur Foundation and the Joan Gans Cooney Center have put out publications that point to the catalytic value of our industry in engaging children on this path, not just not entertainment, but of learning. Um, and much like my, Mr. Norman said, it's, it's embedded in the process. It's not something that is uh, force-fed to them. Um, and then we also make sure that, or the, the, the partners look at how well the games not only are engaging, but they're teaching the material. They also have wonderful assessment mechanisms. When you have a scoring process in a game, the kids are being tested as they're going through it, and they don't even really know. It's just part of the experience, which also makes it fun and engaging. And then finally, it has to scale, because our goal is to develop solutions and exciting uh, opportunities in the classroom that then can be spread throughout the country quickly, because we don't want to waste another generation of children while these innovations are, are, are once they're ready, they should go immediately. Thank you. My time has expired. The gentlelady has yielded back her time. Recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, holding this hearing and calling these witnesses. And um, let's just note that <clears throat> uh, our founding fathers uh, uh, held uh, technology and uh, innovation at a high level, high priority. Uh, very few things are actually written into the Constitution, uh, but patent rights, you know, the word right was only put in the, in the main body of the Constitution uh, when talking about the right technology rights of an inventor or a writer. And of course, uh, my favorite uh, founding father was uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin who, of course, uh, Chairman Hall reminds us a lot of Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> and uh, a meaning a very beloved man. Uh, I was comparing you to Benjamin Franklin, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, we were in law school together. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Uh, the, the significance today is uh, we know and we have the same value on innovation American people place the same value in innovation and technology today. However, we are mired down in our society. We're being held back. And there are forces at play that are holding us back, and not the least of which is the failure of public education, which is mired now in bureaucracy and union roadblocks to excellence, and uh, uh, people uh, in public education refusing to acknowledge that perhaps a science teacher might need to be paid more than a basket weaving teacher or something like that. Uh, so those of you in the private sector are stepping forward, and I think this is a natural uh, happenstance in America, and that is the American people are stepping forward to correct a problem, and that is we don't have the uh, uh, the progress, in, and we call it STEM, but we don't have the progress in science and engineering and mathematics that we should among our, among our young people. And uh, I'd like to first ask Ms. Conrad, uh, in terms of uh, your foundation, uh, how do you, uh, first of all, how do you pay for these awards and everything? I mean, what, uh, you are not a government agency. What, what uh, how do you pay for your upkeep? Good news and bad news. First two years, I funded the program. My children then said to me, Mother, you're about to be put up for adoption. <laughs> and the program got too big for me, so that was the very good news of this. We raise our funds through uh, partnerships with large corporations, for example, Lockheed Martin and uh, PepsiCo and Kraft, and corporations of that nature who really understand and work with us uh, as leaders in developing the innovative workforce for the future. I mean, we are growing their workforce. The amount of money that the students receive as the award for this competition, and we only, we don't do first, second, and third. We do one winner per platform. This year we'll be doing aerospace to create products for use in aerospace. 
energy to create products for use in energy. We, we don't care if it's renewable storage or efficiency. We don't say make this and if you make it better than the next guy you win. We just say here's the problem, make whatever you want. And in this year we're going to challenge students in nutrition and ask them to help solve weight problems, specifically obesity and healthy lifestyles. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, so I mean, they come up with things, they're so out of the box. Uh, we don't tell them there is a box, so they just jump right out and, and create amazing products. Um, the award that they get, we fund one team that wins in each category. We fund them sort of like venture capital. We invest, quote, in their product idea. Some of them have come up with such outstanding products that we help patent them if they need a patent and then help them license their IP into the marketplace. The kids get a $5,000 grant and the grant is there as discretionary. It must be used to continue to develop their product idea. So the funding comes primarily, well at this point, almost solely from, from corporations that work with us. Um, we also have had a discretionary grant, a, pardon me, a um, unsolicited grant from NASA Ames that has been very helpful to us and NASA Ames has been tremendously supportive of our efforts. I think uh, Pete would be uh, very proud of everything you're doing and so am I. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, gentlemen. Years back, and I now get to recognize a gentle lady from Maryland who sits just as far away to the right of me as she can say it. <laughs> recognize her for five minutes. Wow, Mr. Chairman. You know, you started out, uh, Mr. Chairman, this morning um, saying that there weren't a lot of us here, but I think it's important for us to recognize quality and not just quantity. And so I'm glad to be here with uh, the members um, of the committee and also our witnesses. And thank you very much for your testimony. Um, among the occasional frustrations that I have here in this institution is that we are constantly insisting on either or answers, responses and, uh, to questions in a really dynamic world that is anything but either or answers. Um, and that is uh, looking at STEM, the relative role and responsibility of the federal, state and local government of our uh, private partners in developing this next generation so that it has the skill set to compete in the 21st century and I think it's on all of us in each one of these sectors to do what it takes to develop that new ge next generation and I, I take it from your testimony that you share that. Um, I want to start with uh, Mr. Norman because I do understand the value of STEM partnerships like yours. I know that we have Project Lead the Way projects in my uh, congressional district in Prince George's in Montgomery County just outside the city but one of the things that strikes me is that it would be impossible to take advantage of the platform that you offer had it not been for federal grants and uh, state grants and local support for the local school systems that are partners in those projects that having the platform itself is not enough to engage students on an ongoing basis. We need um, the federal support that comes to our, our state and our local uh, school systems to enable the resources and teachers to be able to effectively participate in those projects. Um, you uh, talked in your financial disclosure uh, form, I noticed that you did not mention that you actually have an active grant from NASA, for example. I'm sure you have other, um, or maybe you have other federal grants and opportunities too. And so the work that you're doing and the platforms that you provide aren't just reliant solely on the purview of the private sector. There is, at least at some level, a partnership with the, uh, with the federal government. And so can you explain to us um, why you did pursue federal funding and what value that provides in your ability um, to develop these really innovative and creative programs for, uh, for students around the country? Absolutely. I guess the clarification I need to put in is I, I'm here representing Innovation First International, which has a company that is Vex Robotics that created this platform and finds those partners. The actual Vex Robotics competition is managed by another nonprofit called the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation. That foundation was created after years similar to Ms. Conrad where our self-funding 
was was it was getting overwhelming based on the size and the growth we had and we thought the best way to actually be able to accept more donations from other corporations was to have that true 501c3 backing us so we have actually kind of handed the management off of that competition to that nonprofit. That nonprofit has gone and gotten some NASA grants, and in fact, it's, but it's an extreme minority compared to the corporate donations that exist. But I guess my point is, and I'll go to Ms. Conrad, Mr. Gallagher as well, is that um, all the things that you do, and I think they're really valuable and they're terrific, and you reach um, students. That in order to reach your traditional public school student. Um, who, you know, may not come from a background that allows them to participate in all kinds of other limitations. We do, wouldn't you agree that we do need the combination of the value that we get out of our scientific and research institutions along with what happens in the private sector? I know in my community, NASA, Goddard, NIST, NOAA, these agencies are really unique partners along with our university community that receives federal funding that enables them to assist in our K-12 education. So the federal government and its agencies are not an aside to the work that we, we do. It's a, it's a partner. Isn't that correct? I will say that the partnership, and I will call it that, that we have with NASA has been extraordinary. It's not about funding necessarily, but it is about support in terms of facilities and mentors and information and something that you can't put a number on but has tremendous value not only to the foundation but to the students. I mean our students when they come to NASA Ames to do our Innovation Summit they are so excited to be at a NASA facility and Pete Warden comes and talks to the kids and it's very peer-to-peer -peer, and it gives them a whole different perception of a government agency. Um, it's, it's much more inclusive and more dynamic and interesting and exciting for these young students. The Department of State is working very closely with us now. Not necessarily having anything to do with money, but support and collaboration and partnership and I think when you create new systems and you do it through collaboration and bring silos of excellence together with a strategic plan of actually growing a new system of education, then everyone can get in the sandbox together, so to speak, and actually drive the change that needs to happen from the point of view of collaboration, which may or may not include funding. Thank you. My, my time has run out. And Mr. Chairman, again, the point, though, is, is simply that um, that whether it's resources or facilities and those things, those are resources, those that, that's money also, it just doesn't come in the form of cash. Thank you very much, and I yield. Thank you very much, Ms. Edwards. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Fleischmann, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I want to thank the panel today. This is really incredible. I've enjoyed it very much. I represent the 3rd District of Tennessee, which has the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in it and Y-12, so it's a very, very strong science-centric district, and uh, uh, it, this is really helpful for me. Mr. Gallagher, I have a question for you, sir. You testified that no federal uh, dollar support uh, is involved with your co competitions. At the same time, the National STEM uh, Video Game Challenge is touted as part of the President's Educate to Innovate initiative. Could you kindly detail for us how the two are connected and what the federal contribution is if it's not monetary, sir? I'm very pleased to, to take that question. And um, it's something that we're particularly proud of is when it comes to the role of the government, uh, we see it on the front end as being the beacon of leadership. And then once we develop solutions, exciting uh, tools for use in the classroom, that they actually need to be implemented by government on the state level because that's where the rubber meets the road when it comes to education. So on the, uh, with, with the White House, there's a great enthusiasm for the ability of our industry to connect with youth on STEM related issues and STEM opportunities. And so we were put together with our partners 
through the leadership of the White House as part of an overarching um, uh, leadership initiative that was not funded by federal 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 funds. It's much more of a leadership exercise, and again, shining that beacon. And then we're in the role process now. We're just going to start year two. Will be announced this Friday in partnership with the White House again uh, through the Department of Education. We intend to make that announcement with our partners. We're excited about taking the challenge to the next level. But we'll, when we have these modules, these units that are useful in the classroom, when those then need to be implemented, that's going to need to be done by the teachers on the ground. And it's through uh, great partners like Brain Pop that we would expect to see that happen. Thank you very much. Uh, now I've got a question. I'll start with Mr. Norman and going across the panel. Uh, do you all track the college or career paths of your competitors? And if so, what are you finding? Uh, not from the company side. From the foundation side, they're putting plans in place to try to help track that. But at this time, you know, from the company side and the product side, we, we do not track that. Ms. Conrad? Yes, uh, it, we are tracking it and we are watching our students enter uh, STEM related fields in college. Okay, so there's a direct correlation between what you're doing and, and productivity on the other end. There seems to be. At this Excellent. Point, yes. Mr. Gallagher. Yes, our experience as an industry is almost in reverse. There's such a huge demand within our industry for qualified STEM educated uh, workers that we look at the university system and we see that as the where they're grown. And we just released a study, the Entertainment Software Association did, that uh, counted 343 universities around the country that either offer a curriculum in video games or have degrees in video game uh, technology. 24 of them, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member Johnson, are in the state of Texas. And I'm proud to say that SMU, your alma mater, um, also offers a, a, a program that is focused upon video game excellence and going right into this workforce. So we're seeing it more from we have a need and then let's grow it from the bottom up. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back, sir. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Ohio, Mrs. Fudge, recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Um, just have a few very short questions. First, if you could each just tell me, in a program cycle or year, if that's your cycle, how many young people are involved in your program? Uh, in the VEX Robotics competition, uh, once again, there are several of the other partners that use our platform, but just in the VEX Robotics competition, we were running a right at 4,000 uh, teams from schools, and, and teams range anywhere from 5 to 15 students per team. Okay. Mr. Norman, we'll take your overflow. <laughs> we're very small, we're very young. We get about 600 teams coming into our competition right now. Okay. And the uh, National STEM Video Game Challenge, we had 500 uh, students compete in year one, and then uh, we'll look to see that grow in year two. Thank you. Now let me ask, would, would all of you agree that all students need to have STEM education? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would agree it's a top priority for students to have a grounding in STEM. However, our economy 